Okay, welcome to this next module. And this is the module where we're going to talk about the molecules RNA and DNA. But first we're gonna talk about the question that really has been on the mind of every human being probably since we first could think. And that question is, how did life originate? How did life come to be on this planet? And this question, <clears throat> we have a pretty good idea. We have a pretty good answer, um, you know, that now, nowadays. We have, you know, we've, we've gotten to the point where we can give a pretty solid answer. Um, but there are certainly still things that are um, needed to be explained in, in this overall, um, you know, overall explanation of how life originates. But we've got a pretty, pretty solid idea, but that only came after much trial and error. So the, how, did, how life originated, the first idea was this idea of abiogenesis. And it's sort of this um, life springing out of nowhere, this spontaneous generation of life. And the reason for that is because, <sighs> You know, we could see that, you know, you would have seeds that produced plants, but if you didn't really look at, you know, this is before any science, right? If you didn't really look at things too hard, you wouldn't really understand how animals could suddenly appear in an area. And the first, one of the first dogmas or the, just the overarching thought of that time was that, that, you know, animals would come from certain uh, characteristics in the environment, right? So the, the big one is frogs would come from mud or maggots would come from steak. And so what, what, what they would assume is that if there's a mud puddle, you walk away from it and then a few days later, you come by that mud puddle, there'll be frogs there. So the frogs must have been spontaneously generated from the mud. Or if your steak went bad and you set it out and didn't throw it away, eventually maggots would appear, so maggots must come from steak. Now, that just sort of, you know, is becomes the prevailing thought because nobody really does any science to prove it uh, to be correct or to be incorrect. And it's not until we have actual, you know, scientists that start to come into the idea of, well, we can test these hypotheses that maggots come from steak, and they end up going and getting two uh, identical cuts of steak, leaving one covered and one uncovered, and seeing that they do both go bad, uh, they do both go, you know, rancid, but the one that's uncovered and uh, the, gets visited by flies, and then maggots appear, uh, and then the one that is covered doesn't produce flies, that's when you can start to press against this theory, or sorry, this hypothesis of abiogenesis or spontaneous generation. Um, similarly, with, uh, you know, frogs from mud, you can do experiments to show that frogs are not being produced by the mud, they're just being attracted to that area because it's has now received some moisture. So, once we, we start, um, you know, figuring that out, the next question is, how old is the Earth really? And, of course, we are pretty familiar with the name Darwin, Charles Darwin, and we know that he's taking this long trek on the HMS Beagle and, to be a naturalist, and he's starting to formulate this idea of natural selection and evolution, and this is occurring in the second half of the 1800s. But at the same time, there's another scientist, his name is Lord Kelvin, and he was trying to figure out how old the Earth is as well. And so he figured the Earth probably started as molten rock because he was able to see uh, lava, magma come to the surface as lava, and then solidify and harden as molten rock. And so he starts to come up with this hypothesis, well, that, that must be what early Earth looked like. And he was 100% correct on that aspect. And he starts to do experiments, and he narrows down this timeline, which is incredible for, you know, back then. Uh, he says 20 to 40 million years is likely how old the Earth is. Now, <laughs> that's really good, you know, that's some good math, right? For what, for what he was working with, 
for the technology that he was working with. It's really good. You know, it's incredible to think that he was even thinking that old. You know, most of the religious texts would only say a few thousand years, correct? So it's really incredible that he was able to come up with this. But the problem with that is it doesn't jive with Darwin's theory of natural selection and evolution. Because The reason for that is it takes much, much, much longer than a few million years uh, for this amount of evolution to have occurred. And so once you start getting multiple scientists working together and postulating different, you know, theories, different ideas for, for you know, the, re the way that the world is, you have to start putting them together to see if they work. And this clearly does not work. Now, we know now that Kelvin doesn't account for things like radiation and convection heat. Um, and so it won't be until the 1900s when we actually learn just how old the Earth is. Um, so how old is the Earth? Well, the Earth is as old as the solar system. Um, meteorites were able to be dated using lead-lead dating, and it showed that the Earth is likely 4.6 billion years old. 4.5 to 4.6 billion years old, um, really extremely, extremely old. That, that amount of time is nearly, you know, it's immeasurable in a lot of ways, um, at least in, in terms of our minds. We have very hard, a hard time of understanding uh, millions versus billions versus thousands versus hundreds. Um, if you're, if you're not, uh, if you're not familiar, just look up a million versus a billion and there's really good pictures that show just how large that difference is. Um, and so take a look at that. But Earth is likely 4.6 billion years old. And we get this not just through meteorite dating, but through a bunch of other data. Um, so much, much more than 20 to 40 million years old. So when we talk about the origin of life, um, in order to, to figure out this thing, first we need scientific evidence. And that comes from geology, chemistry, molecular data, fossil data. Of course, that chemistry talking about how life could come from nothing. And then different things called homologies or how things are related. But all of this data, geology, chemistry, bio, biological, uh, molecular data, all of this data needs to come together to, to talk about this, this origin of life. And all of this will original will basically take us to something called the last universal ancestor. So let's talk about the geologic evidence. So at some point, there's this formation of the Earth. And we can talk about the formation of the moon. And this is during what is called the great, the, la, the heavy bombardment, the great bombardment. Basically, the, the Earth is this, uh, after the, the Big Bang, the Earth is getting bombarded by large, large, uh, you know, meteorites. And it's during this Hadean phase. Hades is like, you know, hell, basically. And it is this hellish landscape of just molten rock being slammed by large material. And some of that material is staying with the Earth. And it's the Earth is getting larger. But it's this molten lava ball, basically. And the moon likely forms because of this splash event where a large comet hits the Earth, a piece of the Earth then uh, separates and stays in orbit. And so the Earth is actually quite close to the mantle of, sorry, the moon is quite cl closely um, uh, related to the mantle of the Earth because it was likely part of the Earth at one point. And then the heavy bombardment ends. And, not, and look at that, not long after that, the first life, is, is postulated to have arrived. And so interestingly enough, as soon as you get, you know, the, the, as soon as you get the environment in which life could appear, it basically does appear. And that is the, basically the surface cools down and water is, is suddenly around. Um, and so as basically, and not, you know, there's probably some time in between here, um, life appears as soon as possible. And this continues on for quite some amount of time before we get our earliest photosynthetic species, which are, which are basically bacteria, that then do photosynthesis. Of course, photosynthesis, uh, we know that a byproduct of photosynthesis is producing oxygen. And now, after those 
organisms do photosynthesis for quite some time, the atmosphere at some point becomes oxygen rich and we get our first snowball earth where there's a lot of water. But more importantly, we now have an atmosphere that is oxygen rich, allowing for other organisms that are now going to use that oxygen. And then you can see that once we get to a certain point right around here, we get, oh, the Cambrian explosion, vertebrate land animals, non ape you know, this is where dinosaurs, and you get all of this differentiation in a very, very short amount of time. And so for a long, long period, there's really only single-celled life until suddenly we get this explosion of evolution. And so it's just kind of interesting to think about um, how long the Earth has been around and how relatively short things like other organisms, especially humans, basically, we've been around for less than a half percent of, of the Earth's existence something like 0.044%. So pretty incredible to think about uh, how much change we've imparted upon this planet in such a very small amount of time. So that's the geologic evidence. Let's talk about chemical evidence. Well, let's talk about that primitive Earth again. We, we agree, right, that I just showed you that life didn't just happen right away. Uh, you have to go from having no life to then suddenly making chemical monomers, things like uh, protein, amino acids, uh, not proteins, amino acids that eventually became proteins, um, you know, small monosaccharides, but things that are chemical monomers. And then those monomers have to join together to make polymers, and then eventually things that we call protocells are the first types of basic cells. And then those protocells have to eventually become cells, and then those cells have to become life. But what does this primitive Earth look like? And because if we know that, then we can start to figure out, well, how does this process happen? Because in order for the chemical reactions to occur, the environment in which they are in is very important. So figuring out what primitive Earth looked like is the first step. Well, we know that there's no oxygen in the atmosphere for a long, long time until those photosynthetic organisms uh, arrive, but that was long after we, we life arrived. So, like I said, if we are to study the question of how does life arrive, we've got to study this in an oxygenless environment because there is no oxygen. And the first part of the question is how do we go from chemicals to simple monomers? And the two scientists, Miller and Urey, do an experiment that's now called the Miller-Urey experiment. And in their lab, they're able to simulate an early Earth environment with no oxygen and just a few of those primitive atmospheric gases electricity, which they would assume comes from storms um, and lightning and things of, of that nature, and of course water. And all of those things should be around in an early earth um, environment. And so this is qu quite similar to what the Miller-Urey experiment looked like. So in this g bubble here, they import, <laughs> they uh, put in these gases that were likely around in the primitive atmosphere. NH3, hydrogen gas, methane, and water, and all of that, and then they bring in this lightning, or you know, that's basically what it's supposed to be, but it's just this electrical spark, and then you drip some cold water down, and uh, then there's a heat source from the, how hot the earth was, light was, from the bombardment, and the, and the, um, the liquid hot uh, magma and lava, and basically what happens is you let this stuff go into and get heaten up in the, the ocean, which is likely what was, was going on, was this early earth was, uh, early life was going to appear in the oceans because the land was just totally inhospitable. And you have a sampling probe where you can draw out some of this liquid and see what's in it. So what did they find? Well, they find from just what they put in, heat, electricity, water, some gases, they find 25 amino acids. Now, uh, Miller was the lead scientist, Yuri was sort of his student, and Miller found a few amino acids, and it wasn't until Yuri went back a few years later that he found many, many more. So they find, end up, this experiment ends up finding 25 amino acid, uh, acids, which is amazing because it shows that simple chemistry, a little bit of electricity, a little bit of heat, 
can actually create life. Amino acids, if you're unfamiliar, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Proteins are basically almost entirely what you are made up of. Um, DNA, your DNA, which we'll learn about in a little bit, DNA is the code for what you are. DNA then gets read and produces RNA, messenger RNAs. Messenger RNAs get read by the ribosomes, those little small organelles that make proteins. The ribosomes read the RNA and they put together um, the amino acids in the correct order and they make proteins. And those proteins are basically the building blocks of, of your um, body. And so finding these amino acids and then knowing that amino acids have the ability to come together to make proteins shows that, that just simple chemistry can create life. And even more so, the amino acids that they find are considered to be old amino acid. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they show up in the genes of the last universal ancestor that we know of. The last universal common ancestor, if we were to look at the genetic information of that, they would have those same amino acids. And most organisms, that means, would have these same amino acids, okay? Um, so that, that begins to talk about molecular evidence. Things like how d the DNA of organisms relate to each other and how their RNA does. What types of proteins can they make based on the amino acids that their DNA encodes for? What, um, you know, ATP, what, which is the cellular dollar, basically uh, the energy that the cell uses to do things. Uh, their lipid membranes and how they do cell division. All of these things can be shown and can be used to talk about how related one organism is to another. And you start to put organisms in three separate um, classes, basically, where we talk about the eukarya, which are organisms that have a eukaryotic cell type. A eukaryotic cell type has a nucleus where the genetic information is stored and has other membrane-bound organelles, whereas the bacteria and the archaea um, do not have eukaryotic cells. They have prokaryotic cells, which are much smaller and do not have a nucleus. They just have a little area called a nucleoid uh, area where the where their DNA or their RNA are stored, and they do not have membrane-bound organelles. Um, and basically, the bacteria we are pretty familiar with what bacteria are. The archaea used to be because they look exactly like them. Used to be thought uh, to be bacteria. Um, and it wasn't until we start looking at the molecular evidence that we say, well, actually, the archaea based on their DNA, based on their proteins, are actually closer to related to the eukarya. So they've got to be in their own little uh, separate uh, domain. The three domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And so it is um, postulated that every organism must have come from one type of first common ancestor, the, the last universal common ancestor. One organism must have been the first, and at some point, we have to differentiate into every known th uh, organism type that we have today. And that is the third part of this, this how Earth originated the molecular evidence. Now, what if I told you that if I took your DNA and I, I parsed it out and I looked at the A's, T's, G's, and C's, which you'll learn about what that means. Basically, it's the, your DNA code. The, the, whatever combination of A, T, G, and C is in your genetic code makes you. Now, what if I told you if I looked at that code and then I looked at a banana's code and I said that 50% of that is identical? You are 50% banana, okay? What does that mean? Well, it must mean that the organism that was the last common ancestor between a banana and human beings shared 50% of that DNA. And we still have it today in our cells, and as well as the banana, uh, the banana does. And so it's interesting to think about, uh, you know, the amount of the sheer amount of diversity that we have on this planet uh, right now. A hundred percent started with one single-celled organism, and the amount of of diversity now is just incredible to think about. So here's uh, the great apes are here, uh, the orangutan, the gorilla, the chimps, and the bonobos, and the humans, we are one of the great apes. The gibbons is, a, is, is another example, of, but of, not a great ape. But here is our, uh, our ancestry, 
where we have, of course, Homo sapiens, the pan, which are the bonobos, and the chimpanzees, gorilla, pongo, which are the orangutan, and the hylobates, which are the gibbons. And you can see how we uh, go back in time to the first hominids, the homino hominoidia. Um, and you can tell that the, the great apes here are much more similar than they have much uh, more recent, this is obviously time, where if you went from up to down, the farther down you went would be obviously more recently, and then farther back would be farther away in time. But we share much uh, more recent common ancestors with the bonobos and the chimpanzees, These are, this is our common ancestor, than we do with um, gorillas, and the, or that we do with the orangutans, or certainly the gibbons. And so, yes, we are not so different from chimpanzees, uh, although, you know, we, we probably, some of us like to think of us as, you know, much different and, um, you know, certainly more evolved, and that's true. Uh, we are highly, high, um, you know, higher organisms in terms of our brain's ability, um, but there are trade-offs for that, and uh, I just think it's important to respect these organisms because they are not so different from us. Um, things that are different are, of course, body plan. Um, take a look at the sheer amount of muscle mass that especially like a gorilla or a chimpanzee has compared to a, an adult human man. Um, of course, we seem to have lost all of the hair uh, on our bodies that these organisms have had. Um, and of course, muscle mass. Now, why have we, why have we lost that muscle mass? Well, there's a trade-off because look at the approximate brain size comparison uh, where we have larger brains. And so the amount of energy that our bodies put in to creating this brain is has to be subtracted from the muscle mass. And so, of course, this brain is very, very important and leads us to become very successful organisms. Um, but I just like to, to keep it all in, in terms of respecting, you know, other organisms because we have the ability to understand, uh, you know, the importance of keeping them around. Um, unfortunately, things like deforestation and, of course, global human climate change, um, it, 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 it's not, the, you know, they don't have any control over it. It's our duty to control things like that and to respect where we came from. So with that, I will leave you with this um, video, this TED Talk, and it talks about um, the basically how life on this planet likely originated uh, in the deep sea vents. And the deep sea vents um, are basically probably where this chemistry uh, was able to happen. And so I'd like you to watch this. It should be pretty interesting. And I will see you guys in my next lecture.